Welcome to episode 180 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm going to share some real talk about communicating with difficult colleagues. Visit truthforteachers.com to get the transcript, or find our new Truth For Teachers podcast community on Facebook. You can share your thoughts on the show there and reflect with other listeners in our private group. This episode is sponsored by ViewSonic Education. They are the creator of ViewBoard. It's an interactive whiteboard for the classroom, and MyViewBoard, which is a digital whiteboarding app. Together, these two tools help teachers create engaging lessons from anywhere and then present them in the classroom. Search the internet, open your favorite apps, play educational videos, all from your digital whiteboard. It's finally a solution that teaches the way that you do. To learn more, visit viewsonic.com slash education. So this is going to be a more informal, off-the-cuff episode than I normally do. If you are new to this podcast... This is not what the episodes are normally like. I typically try to keep things super structured and really focused on practical information. This episode will be a little different. Sometimes I just want to speak to you directly from the heart. No scripting, no planning in advance what I want to say, no rehearsing. Just like I'm talking to a friend. So you'll probably hear more ums and uhs and things like that in this episode. And if that's not your preferred format, if you're not into stream of consciousness types of podcast episodes, feel free to skip this one. I won't be insulted. But otherwise, grab yourself a beverage of your choice and let's have some real talk. Because our topic today is communicating with difficult colleagues. I'm hearing more and more from teachers who are having this problem in recent years where coworkers are making them just really anxious and stressed. It might be because of passive aggressive behavior, um, bullying. There's been a huge uptick in bullying, I feel like, from teachers bullying other teachers, gossiping, complaining, just overall just being so negative that it's really hard to um, to co-plan together or just accomplish anything. Um, and sometimes it's it's coworkers who are really controlling or domineering, and you feel like you can't really get a word in edgewise. So we're going to talk about all of those things today in this episode, um, how to respond to people who are like, are like that and how to minimize their impact on you. And the reason why I think that this has become a more prevalent problem recently is because I think teaching is becoming sort of a more collaborative profession than it used to be. But what's happening is you're only getting like the downsides to collaboration. (laughs) You're not really getting the upside. Like the upside of collaboration is supposed to be that like we're better together, right? Like my lessons are going to be better if I have people to bounce ideas off of. And if I feel like you've got my back and I've got your back, but that's not what we're really getting here. What we're getting is teachers feeling pressured to all do things the same way at the same time you know, have the same classroom management policies, same discipline um, policies in place, teach the same lessons at the, you know, use the same homework assignments. Like it's becoming the situation where it's like everyone needs to get on the same page. Everyone needs to agree. And that's being framed as, well, we're working together as a team. But that's not really what teamwork is. And so what happens a lot of times is there's one or two people with really Um, let's say, dominant personalities or more controlling personalities, um, people who maybe just have really clear senses of what they want to do um, and are not afraid to be outspoken about it. And they can kind of control things for the whole team. And it can be really uncomfortable for everyone else. So, um, you know, I want to just sort of acknowledge if this is the situation that you're in, that it is not just you. Um, You know, when I first started teaching in 1999, we could still kind of close our doors and teach. There were always colleagues that I didn't like and that I didn't get along with. Every school I taught in, there were always people where I was like, I would see that person coming and like go the other way. I do not want you in my space. I just don't like your energy or what you bring around you. I just don't want to be near you. And I could avoid that person for the most part. I might have to see them once a week at a team meeting. Um, If they weren't on my team, I might just have to see them at staff meetings. I could pretty much just close my door and teach. And uh, that's just not the case anymore for a lot of teachers. You have to collaborate with these people and you may not have a lot of training and how to do that. I'm just going to tell you what I would tell a friend who came to me 
if one of my friends who's in the classroom came to me and said, Angela, I have this colleague who keeps doing this thing and it's driving me crazy. This is what I would say to that, to that friend of mine. So I'm just talking to you here like a friend and take the advice that resonates with you <laughs> disregard the part that you think doesn't fit your situation. Because these kinds of dynamics are so complicated, it would be impossible for me to give advice that applies to everyone and every single personality. So take what you can use here. I want to start off by talking about what the goal is of working together with teams. I think this gets muddied a little bit because there's a lot of rhetoric around schools being a family, right? Like, you know, this is your school family. And that can make it kind of feel like the goal is just to get along. You know, like, let's, let's just all be peaceful. Let's just not have any tension. Let's make sure no one's uncomfortable. And that's really not the goal here. You know, you're not supposed to be besties with everyone on your team. Uh, you don't even have to be friends with them. This is a professional working relationship. And that can be really tough in teaching. We got to stay focused on the end goal, which is getting the work done for the sake of kids, for making this school the best possible place for kids to learn. That's the primary objective or something similar to that, right? Something focused on the children <laughs> and the best possible relationships and instruction for them. The goal is not avoiding tension. It's not keeping all the teachers comfortable. It's not about not making waves because you don't want to upset people. So think about what you should say and do in all of these difficult situations through the lens of what serves that end goal of having a productive working relationship and doing the best job for kids. You want to be collegial. You want to be professional. This is your job. This is your career path. This is not just a friendship. You got to come together and you got to get things done. So if you can distance yourself a little bit from the situation in that way by thinking about it like, this is my job, um, that can make it a little bit easier. Let's talk about um, passive aggressiveness a little bit first. My advice when you're dealing with passive aggressive coworkers is to be direct in response. People who are passive aggressive, um, they tend to do that because they don't feel empowered to speak their mind. They are afraid of the consequences of being direct, or they don't know how to be direct. And basically, that's the easy way out for them to sort of allude to how they're feeling or allude to what's bothering them, but never actually taking responsibility for communicating that clearly. So if you have a passive aggressive colleague that really kind of makes things difficult for you, respond by being direct. Whatever it is that they're implying, just say it. I, I, I feel like you're really saying this or you're implying this or you're feeling this way. Is that what's going on here? Put it right out there and be non-reactive. Don't get emotional about it. Don't get angry about it. Just, you know, repeat it right back. Is, is, is that what you're saying? Is, is this how you're feeling? Because it's kind of coming across like you're saying it that way. Be very direct in response. And don't necessarily expect an honest answer back. Don't expect them to suddenly bear their soul to you. Although you might get that sometimes. Sometimes they may just say, yeah, that's what I'm feeling right now. Um, but the purpose of the technique is to let the person know that if they are going to choose to be passive aggressive, you will ask a question which puts them on the spot to say exactly what they mean. And they're not going to like that. People who prefer to be passive aggressive don't want to have to say it. So they will figure out quickly that you are not the one to play the passive aggressive game with. And if you find that you are kind of blindsided by it, which is the case a lot of times with passive aggressive people, you have no idea they're upset. And then, you know, you're just sitting at lunch and all of a sudden they just like hit you out of the blue with something they've apparently been stewing about for a long time. Um, then just say back to them, I'm not sure what you mean by that. And just give a very blank expression. Just look them directly in the eye, blank face. I'm not sure what you mean by that. And that puts the person on the hook to say what they mean, to clarify their intent instead of leaving you feeling uncomfortable and leaving you to try to figure out what's wrong, what are they implying, what are they upset about, put it back on them. That works nine out of 10 times um, with the people that I have done that to. And I can tell you one thing that learning to respond to people like that has made me much more cognizant of when I'm being passive aggressive because um, I have that same trait in me. I think a lot of women do. 
Um, we're not really taught how to stand up for ourselves. That's not always a trait that is really valued in women, women who speak their minds. Um, we're not always great at asking for what we need, some of us. So if you are a person who can kind of fall into that trap yourself, keeping other people accountable for their passive aggressiveness will keep you kind of thinking the same thing yourself. When you find yourself slipping into those modes where you want to just make this little side comment, you'll realize, no, I need to just say what I mean here. Let me just be direct and tell the person what I'm feeling. So that's kind of a little side benefit there. Um, let's talk next about coworkers who say inappropriate things about students. They're just sort of like bashing kids or just being negative, that sort of thing. Um, I like facial expressions for this one. So if they are saying something kind of rude about kids or their families and they're expecting you to agree, don't agree. If they're like these parents, yeah, they just don't care about their kids. Just give a totally blank face. Don't nod. Don't agree partially and be like, yeah, some of them are like that. None of that. Just make eye contact. Give no facial expression. Totally blank face. Because the person is only saying those things to you because they expect you to agree. They expect you to chime in with your own complaints. So if you don't give that to them, then that just sort of shuts things down. Um, and you can also say something like, wow, do you really think that? And give them just sort of this incredulous look like, wow, that's how you really feel? Really? <laughs> okay. And then, you know, let them respond to that and then change the subject. So that sort of lets them know that their attitude is not the norm. Everyone does not feel like that. It's not an okay thing to express. But at the same time, you're not getting into an argument or a debate about it because you do have to pick your battles with these kinds of people. Um, you know, they're not going to change overnight. What you're doing is you're shifting the norm. You're making it so that this is not a normal, okay, everyday thing where we go into the staff room and we just complain about kids all afternoon. Now, in other situations, you know, particularly where something truly egregious has been said, you know, maybe there's a racial stereotype or something that the person has said, um, you can be even more direct about it. Um, you know, this is really about figuring out when to go there and when not to go there. And when you hear a colleague who says something that is really, really detrimental to kids, like it's a belief that they hold that um, it's clearly something that can impact the way they see their students, the expectations they have for their students, the way they treat them. Um, I think it's worth speaking up every time, honestly. I once heard someone um, refer to some of her students as crack babies. And um, I made that Chrissy Teigen cringe face. You've seen that meme, right? <laughs> I made that face. I didn't even think about it. It was just my natural reaction. I was just like, ooh, ooh, really? And I said, ah, that, that's, wow, that's really inappropriate and really offensive. I don't know if you realize that, but I feel like I need to let you know that it's inappropriate so that you don't say that in front of parents or students or anyone else, like ever again. That's not a term that we are using in 2019. <laughs> and uh, your colleague may not take that well. Um, and I think you have to kind of pick something that is authentic to you. I didn't really plan those words. That was just kind of what came out. It, it was just sort of like a gut reaction. Um, I, again, I'm, I don't bill myself as an expert in this kind of situation. so I don't even know if that's the right thing to say. But I knew I wasn't going to let it slide. That was the one thing that I knew for sure. Because the only reason why I would do that is to make sure that I stay comfortable, right? And that my colleague would stay comfortable. So, you know, just avoid tension, all that kind of thing. But remember, that's not the goal here. Our goal is not to avoid tension. Our goal is to make these classrooms and this school the best possible place for kids. So if we have to be uncomfortable sometimes, you know, that's fine. I can't let a colleague continue working with children without ever examining her biases and her prejudices and her stereotypes. Kids are at risk of being harmed if I don't speak up. So, you know, maybe you're not able to think of the right thing to say in, a mo in the moment, that can be tricky, you know, if you're not expecting it or, you know, you're not really focusing on the conversation and it comes out of nowhere. But let your facial expression show that was not okay to say that. And then you can always approach the person afterwards. You know, ha take some time to think about it, maybe discuss it with someone else and then, you know, go to them and say, hey, can I talk with you about something? When you said X, Y, and Z the other day in our meeting, I feel like I need to really share with you how that phrase or how that perspective can be hurtful to some people. And you can educate them a little bit on it. You can share with them alternatives, you know, why this is not okay to say what we say instead and that sort of thing. And the person may not totally understand, 
but leave the door open for them to ask you questions or to talk about it again later. And never, ever feel bad about doing this, about putting this person on the spot, holding them accountable, making them feel uncomfortable. Do not pressure yourself into making allowances for them. Just be like, oh, you know, they're older or they're from a part of the country that's, where that's okay or whatever kinds of excuses people tend to make for that type of person. You know, because we all know teachers like that, right? Like I think every school has a teacher who was just like, ah, what are they saying? What are these words that are coming out of their mouth? And you don't know what to say to them, you know, but we can't make excuses for them because kids are being harmed. If you're working with kids, you got to be examining your own biases. You've got to be really reflective on your language choices all the time. You know, the resources are out there. Everyone has access to the same internet. You can, everyone can Google things, you know, you can all learn to do better. So if your colleagues aren't doing better, let them know, you know, um, there are just, there's some things that you just, you, you got to just um, confront head on. And remember that the goal is to help kids. It's not to keep us all comfortable. Now, let's lead in here to the issue of bullying, because this is a question that I get a lot too. What do you do with teacher bullies? Um, and it's, it's tough for me to respond to that, because I, when people use that term bullying, they're referring to a very wide range of issues. In a true bullying situation, your administrators and your union, if you have one, really need to be made aware of the situation. Like there's a whole protocol for handling things like this. It needs to be taken very seriously. So the remaining advice that I give you here, please don't think that I'm minimizing it. If you were being bullied, like absolutely let somebody know um, for sure. However, a colleague hurting your feelings is not bullying. A colleague being rude to you is not bullying. They're just being rude or they're just being domineering. And similarly, someone pressuring you to do something is not necessarily bullying. There will always be people who are more aggressive or more controlling or, um, you know, a little bit more forceful in their speech who are on staff. And those people tend to have a bigger influence than the folks who are more quiet or more laid back or, you know, are introverted or, you know, don't like to speak, you know, are afraid to speak up. They don't want to rock the boat or anything like that. And I think it's very hard to have a good working relationship with someone that you have placed a label on. So if you and your friends are referring privately to a person as a bully, then you're going to see every sort of controlling behavior or any every time this person like speaks up and takes the lead on something, you're going to see that as bullying when in fact it may not be bullying. And if you have a group of friends at school who all agree that this person is, you know, a bully or is like dominating your team or not letting anyone else talk, then you have power in those numbers. You have the strength together to stand up for yourself. One person on a team of six can't control the whole team when the other five are in agreement that they would like to have more voice. The five of you need to band together and say, okay, what are we going to do next time we have a meeting? How are we going to speak up here? True bullying involves an imbalance of power where the bully is bigger or stronger or has more authority than the other person. It's a power play. And if this team member has equal positioning as you, and there's several teachers who feel taken advantage of by that person or sort of pressured by that person, then I think you can work together to change that dynamic. Speak up for one another. Speak up for yourselves when that colleague starts to try to control things. Really have each other's backs. Make the bully, or really, I shouldn't, here I am using that same label, make this person who you perceive as bullying or make this person who has been controlling the conversation, make that person feel uncomfortable instead of it always being you. They can't always have their way. That's not how a team works. And I don't want to make it sound like I'm victim blaming here, like, you know, oh, it's your fault that you're being treated that way. However, a person who exhibits this kind of behavior can only get away with it if the school culture allows it. So if you and your friends at school are tired of being treated badly by one of your coworkers, then get together, decide how you're going to respond. Maybe you'll say, you know, next time you sit down and you have a meeting, I feel like I don't have a say in how we plan our lessons because you get upset when we don't do things your way. We need to have more input here. Can we please share how we're doing our lessons and can we work on some more compromises this week? This will be uncomfortable. You can't avoid that. You will have to get uncomfortable. And that's okay because you're already uncomfortable, right? It's you who is just sort of doing all the stewing and the worrying and the being anxious about it. Put it out there on the table. Be direct about it. Speak up for what you need and step into your power. 
You are a degreed professional who was hired to do a very important job. You have important um, inputs and insights to share. Even if you're new and this person has been teaching for a long time, your opinions and your preferences are still important. You still deserve to be heard and you should be able to speak up. So when you see that kind of inappropriate or domineering behavior, correct it together and um, and don't be afraid to, to speak up there. So let's talk a little bit now. Um, I won't go into quite as much depth about this, but we'll talk about gossiping and we'll talk about complaining. Um, this is something that I hear a lot of teachers ask about, just co- colleagues who are kind of constantly gossiping. And, you know, I, I have some empathy for that because I feel like we all like to gossip on some level, right? It, it's just human nature. When it feels like it's getting out of control, though, that's when you need to speak up. And you can just say something like, I feel like we're spending a lot of time talking about other people and it's kind of bringing me down. Or you might say, you know, we've been talking about this person and it's making me a little bit uneasy. I feel kind of bad about it. Do you feel bad about it? Like, it feels kind of weird, right? Just put that out there. You're not really judging the behavior. You're not judging them. You're not saying you will never do it again. You're just expressing what you notice and feel. Just saying, you know, it just, it doesn't feel great to me to have this conversation. I feel a little weird about this right now. I, I want to change the subject. And that might be enough for the other person to kind of get it. And they might say, yeah, I feel kind of icky about it too, but I didn't want to say anything, you know, or maybe they just won't come to you next time they feel like gossiping. People who like to gossip gather with other gossipers and they'll just learn, okay, she's just not the one to do that with. But if they keep doing it around you because it's just such a habit, then your best bet really is to not engage. And I'll talk about that here a little bit more in conjunction with complaining, because that's really the strategy that I recommend um, with complaining too. So here we're talking about coworkers who are complaining or gossiping, and it's the same thing over and over again. Like (laughs) we've already been down this road, we've hashed this out, we cannot change this thing, and yet here we are still talking about this thing. My advice is just say nothing, absolutely nothing, not one word. You can nod, you can, mm mm-hmm, but nothing else. And to be really honest with you, I do this sometimes with my husband uh, when he's ranting about the same thing for the hundredth time. I just let him talk as much as he wants because he's not going to (laughs) stop. He's not going to stop talking about it until he's gotten it out. He needs to get out of his system. So I just let him do that. I'm his partner. I'm happy to do that for him. But I don't engage. And as he keeps going, he realizes he's not getting a reaction out of me. You know, I'm not feeding into it. But he also doesn't get mad at me because I'm I'm not shutting him down. I'm not ignoring him. I'm not making him feel bad about it. I'm just listening. Just mm -hmm, mm mm-hmm, 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 oh, mm -hmm, mm-hmm. That's it. I just let him express himself. And uh, when he's done, I change the subject. The truth is that we all have our tangents. We all have our pet peeves. I have my own things too, trust me, that he has heard me (laughs) go talk about over and over and over again. So if we can just kind of remember that, that we have certain things that we like to complain about endlessly and just sort of bear with our colleagues in that way and just say, okay, this is her thing. She needs to get this out. Just let her say it. Don't engage, you know, just let her vent because you need to vent sometimes too. But you don't owe them a response. You don't owe them a solution. You don't owe them commiserating. If things have already been discussed, you don't have to keep rehashing with that again. Now, I'm going to give you a few more sort of closing thoughts here. And I'm also going to give you a takeaway truth. But I want to tell you that I have two other episodes that are on similar topics. So if you're liking the direction of this, and you're wanting more, check out season four, episode 16. It's called the five most common and most difficult teacher coworker problems. So I talk about like uh, co planning together and some other issues related to coworkers in that one. That's season four, episode 16. And you also might want to check out episode 141. And that is about chronically complaining coworkers. So people who just completely drain your energy because they're so negative all the time. And by the way, <laughs> I one of the responses that I got from that episode is what if that complainer is me? And I'm going to address that in an upcoming episode. If you feel like, wait a second, I'm the complainer. I'm the one who's always negative here. We're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about it within the context of how to advocate for change without being seen as difficult or pushy or negative. Because sometimes the person on the staff that we think is negative or that we think is a complainer is actually the person who just sees the problem really clearly. And 
believes that it's not acceptable. I mean, we know there's a lot of stuff happening in schools that is not okay. The way that teachers are treated, the way that students are treated sometimes, not okay. And a lot of times people don't want to speak up. So there's one or two people who are always doing the heavy lifting, always the one holding people's feet to the fire and pushing for change all the time. And they get labeled as negative. They get labeled as being a complainer. So we're going to talk about that. How do you advocate for change without being perceived that way? How do you actually do this effectively? So we'll get to that later in the season. So this part might sound a little bit cliche, but I want to tell you the thing that has helped me the most in working with adults um, and getting along with colleagues. It's this quote that originally um, came from the philosopher Plato. It's be kind to everyone you meet, for everyone is fighting a hard battle. And that might sound a little counterintuitive given what I've shared. I (laughs) I want to clarify that being kind does it mean just letting people stay stuck on their problems? If this person has a bad habit, if this person is controlling other teachers, not letting them have a voice, is not doing the right thing by students, the kind thing is not just leaving them alone to just continue to harm kids and to continue to just like bully all their coworkers. That's not kind. The kind thing is to let them know how they can do better to hold them accountable for the energy that they bring to the situation, for the choices that they're making. The kind thing is to look out for the greater good of the school. So I think that we can be kind and remember that that's not the same thing as being nice. It's not the same thing as making people feel comfortable or being polite to them. We're being kind in that we're being compassionate. We're understanding where they're coming from and we're working with them to try to create change instead of just labeling them as the enemy, to labeling them as the problem, to recognize that a lot of the faults that they have, we have in ourselves too. And that's part of the reason why they drive us nuts. (laughs) Being kind to everyone you meet and knowing that they're fighting a hard battle. You know, some of your most difficult colleagues might be having a most difficult life, right? Like they might be stuck in a really unhappy marriage They may have just had a miscarriage. They may be going through uh, problems. You know, maybe their teenager is, you know, is using drugs. Like who knows? People go through all kinds of stuff that we don't know about. You know, there's there's so much more to, to the way that people act than what we can see. And there's always reasons for things behind the scenes. So while it's not easy to respond to other people through a lens of empathy, Um, it can really be helpful to sort of let go of the judgment and the labels and to just really try to understand. You know, I I think of judgment, the opposite of judgment to me is curiosity. So instead of looking at the situation and being like, oh, this person is that, oh, this person is impossible, let's get curious about it. What's going on? Why is this person acting like that? What's going on in this person, in this person's life that is making him or her feel, um, feel this way or say those things or behave in those ways? What unmet need is going on? You know, people who are really domineering or controlling um, tend to be people who are really afraid of things not going well. They might be high achievers. You know, they may be someone who really cares about doing a good job for kids and is just sort of paranoid that if things aren't all done their way, that things won't be done, quote unquote, right, you know, and that they'll get blamed. Like there's reasons for people to act the way they do. And the more that we can respond to them with a spirit of curiosity, rather than a spirit of judgment, the easier it is to be kind to them. And remember, they are fighting a hard battle. And that's the secret to being able to act rather than react. They're not able to just bait you into these, you know, debates or arguments or whatever. Their emotions can be way up here and you can just stay level and calm because you're viewing them through this lens of empathy and curiosity rather than judgment. You are acting from this place within yourself instead of reacting to whatever they do. So that's your takeaway truth for the week ahead. Remind yourself that everyone is doing the best that they know how to do. They're doing the best that they're capable of in this moment, and that includes you. Show yourself grace as you practice responding to these frustrating situations in ways that will create less stress. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it.